Welcome everybody to our Pattern Recognition Symposium. My name is Andreas Meyer and I am the host of the symposium. And we regularly every six months have this workshop where all of our PhD students are presenting on their research and give an update what they have been working on over the past half year. So this is also accompanied with invited talks and on this pattern recognition symposium I'm very proud that we have welcomed Gary Marcus from Robust AI and Pim de Haan from the University of Amsterdam. And in this first video on our pattern recognition symposium I want to feature the presentation by Pim de Haan. He is a second year PhD student of the University of Amsterdam and a research associate at Qualcomm AI Research. Under the supervision of Max Welling, he works on building machine learning methods that take into account the geometry and symmetries of the domain using mathematics of groups, representations and categories. Prior to his PhD, Pim was a visiting researcher at UC Berkeley's Robotics and AI Lab and obtained a master's degree in Artificial Intelligence in Amsterdam and in Theoretical Physics at the University of Cambridge. So today Pim will show us a bit on his latest work on natural graph networks and how to use basic category theory to make graph networks more expressive. Pim, it's a great pleasure to have you here and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. So Pim, the stage is yours. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the invite. So I'll be talking about our, um, uh, the work we presented at NeurIPS uh, last year uh, called Natural Graph Networks. And in this talk, I'll try to uh, introduce some basic concepts from, from category theory. And I'll try to show how we can use these to make more expressive uh, graph neural networks. And along the way, we'll be using some uh, techniques that have been used uh, with quite some success to make equivariant neural networks on the images, and we'll uh, see how they can be applied to, uh, to graphs. And this has been a collaboration with uh, wonderful uh, help from uh, Taco Cohen and, uh, and Max Welling at the University of Amsterdam and, uh, and Qualcomm AI Research. And during this talk, I'll be uh, first um, looking into uh, kind of a basic building block for a lot of graph neural networks that are around these days, which are based on message passing, also called message passing networks. And I'll give you an example of uh, where they are lacking, uh, what are problems that they cannot solve, and thus where there may be room for improvement. Um, then I'll set up a bit of notation about what do we mean by graphs and what are the symmetries of graphs. And then um, we'll look at prior work um, called equivariant graph networks that try to use the symmetries of graphs to make graph networks more expressive. Um, and I'll show you where uh, we can generalize over these, um, generalizing equivariant to something called a natural transformation to build uh, a global version of our natural graph networks. And lastly, uh, we'll talk about a local version of our natural graph network that is also scalable to larger graphs, which is so, so uh, a property we generally desire. Um, so as you probably know, uh, neural networks on graphs are, uh, have experienced a massive boom in popularity in the last uh, five years or so. Um, and that's basically, I guess, because a lot of problems can be reformulated or are already naturally formulated in terms of information processing on graphs. So you can think of uh, friendships in some social network being represented as a graph. You can think of molecules being represented by a molecular graph, or even uh, 3D shapes being represented by um, the graph of, of uh, vertices and edges 
of a me of a 3D mesh. So in all these problems, if you have good uh, neural networks that process information on graphs, then we can solve a lot of these problems at the same time. So that's why graph, in graph neural networks are of great interest. Um, message passing networks are kind of an umbrella term under which a lot of um, um, uh, graph neural networks can be categorized. And uh, we start by having a, a simple graph and we uh, denote uh, two uh, um, nodes here, uh, Q and P. And um, what a message passing network does is it passes messages among, over edges and then aggregates them. So we start with some feature vector at Q and then we compute the message from Q to P by some, for example, linear transformation on this input feature. And then so the second step, we aggregate them, for example, by summation, all the incoming messages at P to find new features at P. And here we're looking at um, uh, linear messages, but this um, message passing networks also apply to nonlinear functions. Um, and uh, this whole story, uh, as I'll present it here, will also be uh, very much uh, regarding linear message passing functions, but can also be trivially generalized to nonlinear message passing functions. And important to note here is that the computation here basically goes over edges. So uh, um, the, the cost of computing one uh, message passing, that, uh, one round of message passing is scales linearly in the number of edges. Basically, that's what we require for our methods to be scalable to larger graphs. Um, since 2018, um, there have been some nice counterexamples found that show that these conventional message passing networks fail at some rather trivial tasks. So if we have these two regular graphs, uh, meaning that they all have uh, the same number of edges, all nodes have the same number of edges, then uh, no conventional message passing network can discriminate between these two graphs. And uh, even though they're clearly different graphs, uh, these networks all fail at them. And uh, it has been analyzed by relating it to a certain graph isomorphism test called the weiss feder lehmann test. And uh, since then, a um, uh, whole uh, zoo and, and, and a taxonomy of graph networks have, um, have um, been found. Um, but the conventional message passing networks that most people use are, are very weak and fail at this rather simple uh, task. So clearly there's room to improve over these. But let's set up some, some notation first. What we mean here by um, a graph um, is, uh, or how we choose to, uh, to uh, formulate that is a graph is just a, um, a tuple of vertices and vertices here we take to be labeled by a natural number uh, because in the end in our computer, we need to um, uh, store these uh, um, vertices. Um, and uh, edges and edges are, uh, subs are relations on these uh, vertices. Um, and, um, and a curious or an important property of graphs is um, that they have graph isomorphisms. Um, and graph isomorphisms are um, maps between two graphs from a graph G to a graph G prime that are bijections on the set of vertices such that edges are mapped to edges. To give an example, here we have uh, two graphs of four nodes, and um, they are essentially the same graphs, but the nodes are ordered differently. So by the bijective relabeling of nodes, we can map the graph to a graph. Uh, a, a special case of a graph isomorphism is a graph automorphism, or a um, um, also known as a graph symmetry. And this is a graph isomorphism mapping the graph to itself. So it's a permutation of the vertices um, um, such that the edges remain the same. So before we can talk about graph neural networks, we need to talk about what are features on graphs um, because neural networks will transform these into new features. So imagine uh, again, we have um, a graph and a, and a graph isomorphism between them. We can, one thing we could do is assign to each node in the graph a real number. And then what's important is that whenever we have a graph isomorphism, we need to have some way of relating the features from the original graph to the new graph. And we do that by a linear transformation um, 
on the features that we associate to the graph isomorphism. Um, so one example of a graph feature is just of, of a graph of n nodes is just to um, take Rn and uh, permute the, uh, the columns uh, under a graph isomorphism. Uh, another example would be to associate a matrix to a graph, uh, where then a um, graph isomorphism translates to a permutation of the rows and columns of this matrix. We can see this a bit more generally um, by uh, realizing that whenever we have a graph isomorphism and the set of vertices are uh, just the numbers uh, one to n, that uh, every graph isomorphism corresponds to a um, permutation of these vertices, of these nodes. Um, and um, the permutations of nodes are from a group called the group uh, Sn of permutations over n symbols. And now a general graph feature um, in this way of looking at it is a, a representation of the group Sn. And the representation consists of a vector space V. And for each permutation, a linear map uh, from the vector space to the vector space um, such that um, a composition of permutation uh, is reflected in composition of the linear maps. But this is a general group representation. And for the specific case of um, uh, these permutations, um, we can see that uh, we can use representations of this group as features for a graph neural network. So given these features, we can build neural networks mapping between such features. Um, and uh, the case of such equivariant graph networks have been uh, um, discussed uh, by several authors um, and often called equivari equivariant graph networks. And these do the following. If we have two representations of the group Sn, then uh, simply what we want is a linear or nonlinear map, uh, mapping from the input feature space to the output feature space. And this requires then to satisfy an equivariance property, meaning that for all permutations, um, we have a, a, a diagram that commutes, meaning that if we first apply the neural network to map from our input feature space to our output feature space, and then um, uh, transform the output feature space under the permutation with the output representation, that this yields the same result as first applying the input representation with that permutation, and then applying the neural network. And this is a, the equivariance property. And, um, uh, and this is critical, because it means that whenever the input is related by permutation, that the neural network will produce an output that is also related by permutation. And this basically means that uh, whenever we have inputs that are essentially the same, um, only, only related by an action of the group, that we're, that we're getting outputs that are also essentially the same, such that our neural network isn't arbitrarily dependent on the particular ordering of the nodes that we chose, but that basically, um, it treats the information similarly, um, uh, regard, irrespective of the ordering. And um, for example, Maron in, in 2018 found that um, whenever this KN is linear, um, the, uh, there are 15 uh, parameters for such a um, uh, linear map, uh, regardless of N. Um, and uh, for uh, most of these representations, such as the matrix representation I introduced uh, earlier, the computational cost of this actually scales polynomial in N, uh, because these involve matrices like N squared, and uh, thus they aren't really scalable to larger graphs. And a large motivation for this research is to find similarly powerful uh, equivariant graph networks, because these class of methods have been shown to be very expressive, um, but to find similarly expressive networks, but with better computation, uh, better scaling uh, to larger graphs. But first we observe the, observe the following. If we have two features on two graphs, like these two shown on the right, that both have four nodes, but aren't isomorphic in any way, 
An equivariant graph network will nevertheless share weights um, when processing information between them. But there's no reason from symmetry to do so because there's no graph isomorphism relating the two. Um, so, um, and, and this happened because we, when building the equivariant graph network, we forgot about the adjacency matrix. Uh, we forgot about the adjacency structure of the graph and we just uh, treat um, the graph as a single, um, the graph features as a single group representation, uh, forgetting everything about the graph. So what we can do instead is looking at categories. A category in general uh, consists of um, a collection of objects and a collection of morphisms or arrows between these objects. Um, and these uh, morphisms um, should satisfy composition and the composition should have a composition between two morphisms. And this composition should be associative. And furthermore, furthermore there should be a identity morphism on all objects. Um, and the category that we'll be mainly looking at is the category of graphs, where, we say, where the objects of the graphs are all graphs, where, uh, where the nodes are labeled with natural numbers. Um, the morphisms are the graph isomorphisms we discussed earlier. This is a special form of a category called the groupoid, um, which basically means simply means that all morphisms are invertible. Another example of a category is a group. So given any group, we can define a category, which is a groupoid with only a single object. And note here that the group elements here are the morphisms um, mapping from the unique object to the unique object. And it's easy to see that all the axioms of a group, um, such as associativity of composition um, th and the fact that uh, identities exist, plus the fact that all morphisms are invertible, um, ex exactly coincide with the axioms of a group. Um, so we know about groups and we know about group representations. Uh, and now we'd like to find similar uh, concepts for um, um, for more general things than groups, more general categories. And these things are functors. So if we have two categories, then a functor from a category C to a category D uh, associates to each object in the source category, an object in the target category, and for each morphism in the source category, a morphism in the target category. And um, this should be such that uh, composition is preserved, meaning that the, uh, the, uh, the functor applied to the composition of two morphisms yields the composition of the functor applied to each morphism individual. And also this, we've already seen an example, namely representations. A representation of a group is a functor from the category corresponding to the group to the category Vec of vector spaces and linear transformations. What this does, this functor rho, it maps the unique object to the vector space V of the representation and ma maps each element in the group to a um, linear map from the vector space to itself. And uh, again, you can easily verify for yourself that this axiom, that this, um, or it's trivial to see that this uh, axiom of Preserving composition is exactly uh, the axiom for a group representation. So here we see that these concepts from groups and group representations uh, very naturally generalizes uh, to these more uh, general concepts of categories and functors. What we'll be doing is we'll, be, we'll, we'll say that a graph feature is also a functor. Uh, but now from the category of graphs to the category of vector spaces. And what this does, it assigns to each graph a feature vector space uh, that we call VG, um, and to each graph isomorphism, a linear transformation between these vector spaces. Now the last concept from category theory to introduce um, is, um, the concept of a natural transformation, which will be our generalization of the notion of equivariance. So if we have two functors, um, both from a category C to the category D, then the natural transformation between these functors 
means uh, consists of uh, for each object in the source category a map from um, the functor applied to that object, the first functor applied to that object, um, to the second functor applied to the object. Satisfying a commuting diagram for each morphism in the source category. And again, we've seen an example of this, namely equivariance is an example um, uh, of a natural transformation. Um, because if we have two um, representations of the group SN, then a um, natural transformation between these two functors is a um, function from the vector space from the input vector space to the output vector space, such that applying this function and then a permutation yields the same result as first applying the permutation and then, and then um, the natural transformation. So here we see that also the notion of an equivariant of equivariance can be easily uh, generalized um, to this notion of a natural transformation. So now we come to the, having introduced these concepts, we can say what we mean by our global natural graph network. Um, and, and that's the following. If we have two graph features, which again are functors from the category of graphs to the category of vector spaces, then a global natural graph network is simply a natural transformation between these functors. So what does that mean? That means that for all graphs, we get a, a map from the um, input feature vector space of that graph to the output feature vector space of that graph. And this satisfies um, the following property. So we have a graph G here, and we have um, the um, feature vector space row of this graph. And for each graph, we have a linear transformation from the input feature vector space to the output feature vector space. Now, if we have an isomorphism from graph G to the graph G prime, um, we um, have a linear transformation associated to that from the feature vector space G to the feature vector space G prime. Um, and such that this diagram should commute so that uh, applying the um, our, our map, our uh, neural network, or linear map, um, on the input feature vector space of G to the output vector space at G, and then transforming with the isomorphism to G prime, yields the same result as first transforming to G prime, and then applying the neural network at graph G prime, or the, the map KG prime. So let's look a bit more at this naturality constraint, this diagram we just saw. So what are the consequences of that? So if we have two uh, graphs um, with an isomorphism between them, then the constraint says that um, the, uh, the map K on G prime is fully determined um, by the map on G uh, because these um, row matrices are invertible. So this means that we get weight sharing whenever we have two graphs that are isomorphic. Furthermore, if you have an automorphism um, of a graph to itself, uh, this prime shouldn't be there, excuse me, um, then we have a linear constraint on KG, basically saying that if we left apply this matrix here or right apply it here, the outcome is the same. And this gives us a linear constraint on KG when KG is linear. And so when KG is linear, we can uh, compute a basis of solutions and linearly combine those with learnable parameters. Um, and um, if we look at an example, then we see that if we take um, this um, uh, graph with four nodes um, and we take the imp this input feature vector space, R4, um, mapping to, um, um, to the output feature space, again, R4, that if we were to use an equivariant graph network, uh, this network would have two parameters. This is sometimes also uh, called deep set. Um, basically, we have a diagonal and an off-diagonal term. 
And this is uh, because the equivariant graph network gets a constraint for all permutations um, in, an, in S4. However, the natural graph network gets a constraint only for all the automorphisms of the graph. And the automorphisms of this graph are just swapping one and three, node one and three, and swapping nodes two and four. So these are fewer constraints. And because we have fewer constraints, we have more solutions. So in this particular case, the natural graph network between these two uh, graph features has six parameters, so, so, uh, in, indicating that um, the natural graph network is more expressive than um, the equivariant graph network because the natural graph network is specific for each graph and is only constrained by automorphisms, whereas the um, equivariant graph network is uh, the same for all different graphs and constrained by all permutations. But this approach of global natural graph networks has, has some disadvantages. One obvious one is that we only share weights when global graphs are isomorphic. But if graphs grow, the probability of them being isomorphic becomes very small. So that means that we get very little weight sharing, which is very impractical in practice. Furthermore, it's very expensive to compute these isomorphisms for large graphs. And also, as we saw earlier, these global linear transformations, they do not scale to larger graphs. So what we'd like to have instead is a local natural graph network that still satisfies this global naturality constraint, but is local in a way that it's not about big uh, global message passing networks. Um, and that the, um, the message passing kernel um, should be, can be reused when edges are locally similar, not only when they're globally similar. And furthermore, that the linear constraints on these kernels um, are um, by the symmetries of the local of local neighborhoods in the graph, which are much cheaper to compute than finding the symmetries of the global graph. And as a consequence, if we satisfy this locality um, criteria, then we uh, get something that is uh, whose computational cost scales linear in the number of edges and nodes, which is a requirement for having scalable graph scalable methods. So we do this by studying the local symmetries. So imagine we have this graph and we uh, look at uh, three um, nodes on this graph, the three uh, edges on this graph denoted by an arrow. Then for each of these edges, uh, we can define neighborhoods here denoted in the different colors. Then if we have a, um, a global symmetry of the graph, um, a global graph isomorphism, then what we see is that actually all these um, global, um, that if we look at these neighborhoods uh, themselves, then we can see that actually um, restricted to these neighborhoods, the global, uh, the global graph isomorphism actually restricts to a um, graph isomorphism of a smaller graph, a little graph that we call the edge neighborhood. So if you can build a method that Set that, is, that satisfies such a naturality constraint only for these local neighborhoods, then we also satisfy the naturality constraint for the, global, for the graph as a whole. And we'll do that roughly in the following way. Um, we're gonna have for each node a feature vector space. And again, like in a message passing network, um, we're gonna have a, a message passing function that maps the feature vector space here from P to Q. Now, whenever these edges are isomorphic graphs, we want to do weight sharing between the kernel on edge PQ and the kernel on edge P prime Q prime. Furthermore, whenever such an edge neighborhood has a symmetry, we want to have a linear constraint on these functions KPQ. Uh, so how do we set it up? Um, well, again, uh, we can quite elegantly do that with uh, these uh, using categories. So uh, we start with the category of node neighborhoods. Um, and this node neighborhoods, this category of node neighborhoods is very similar to the category of graphs. But now the objects are small graphs um, that, we, uh, that we call GP around the node 
P. So for example, if this is the whole graph and this is node P, we say that the, um, the corresponding node neighborhood of P is this subgraph that we call GP. Um, and the morphisms of this category are um, graph isomorphisms of this neighborhood. Um, and, um, and this is such that if um, uh, we map from node neighborhood GP to G prime P prime, and then this graph isomorphism must map P to P prime. Similarly, we can define the category for the neighborhoods of edges. Uh, so con it contains objects like GPQ, containing a neighborhood of the edge PQ, and um, also the morphisms in this category are just graph isomorphisms of these neighborhoods. And lastly, we can um, define functors from the category of edge neighborhoods to the category of node neighborhoods. And simply, uh, and we can define two of them, um, one for the uh, start for, or the, the head of the edge and one for the tail of the edge. Uh, and we call these F0 and F1. So F1, for example, maps uh, the edge neighborhood GPQ to the node neighborhood of Q. And it maps um, is isomorphisms of the edge neighborhood to isomorphisms of the node neighborhood of the tail of the edge. So it maps uh, an isomorphism GPQ to GP prime Q prime to an isomorphism GQ to GQ prime. Now a local natural graph network, which is kind of our, uh, our main contribution, um, consists of, uh, consists of uh, feature vector spaces uh, um, that assign a feature space to each node. And we encode that by a functor mapping from node neighborhoods to vector spaces, to, to, which just means that we assign to each node P and its node neighborhood a vector space P. And to each node neighborhood isomorphism, a linear map um, from P from the vector space of P to the vector space of P prime. Uh, we can compose these node features um, uh, with these functors F0 and F1 to assign to all edges um, where, where the first one assigns to all edges the feature vector space of its of the head of the edge. Um, and the second assigns to e, an edge the feature vector space of the tail of the edge. And now the local natural graph network um, maps from the one functor to the other functor. Um, and what this means is that for each edge, PQ, we have a map uh, from the input feature space at P to the output feature space at Q. And this satisfies the following uh, property. It means that um, we have a feature vector space associated to P um, and um, our kernel maps from um, a, feature, a feature at P to a feature at Q. Um, so we have a separate kernel uh, for all edges. Uh, but whenever we have an isomorphism of edges, um, then when we apply the isomorphism from P to P prime, and then do message passing to Q prime, then we get the same result as first um, applying message passing from P to Q and then transporting with the isomorphism to Q prime. So this again gives us constraints on these kernels KPQ. And similarly to before, um, this means that whenever we have um, edges um, that are isomorphic, uh, their kernels share weights. And whenever we um, have an automorphism of these neighborhoods, we get linear constraints on these linear kernels. So in summary, we can kind of uh, see a basic algorithm. What we first do in a pre-compute phase is we define these nodes and edge neighborhoods. 
we can uh, arbitrarily uh, choose to make these large or small. And then we classify the edge neighborhoods in terms of these isomorphism classes. Then for each of these is for each uh, isomorphism class, we compute the automorphisms because these automorphisms give us constraints on the kernels. Uh, we can solve for these constraints, um, find the basis of solutions, which we linearly combine with parameters. And then during runtime, um, we uh, linearly combine the solutions with parameters um, and then uh, transport these kernels with the isomorphism to all the edges in the isomorphism class. And that allows us to compute the message passing or convolution. This algorithm um, is linear um, in terms of the number of edges if we keep the neighborhood size fixed. So um, basically, uh, uh, the during training step is linear in the number of edges, but computing these edge automorphisms um, and finding the isomorphism classes um, becomes very expensive when the edges are very large. So this is a scalable strategy um, when the edges are relatively small, but for example, if a graph is fully connected, these edge neighborhoods are very large, uh, and these computations are very expensive. So the scalability of this method depends on the graph, but we found, we found it to scale well to larger graphs in practice. Um, an interesting property, and which also was a bit motivational to the whole approach, is that um, when um, we apply our method to a graph that has that is a regular lattice, like we see here with this triangular lattice, and we choose our um, node features or our representations, right? Uh, then we get that our method exactly coincides with a group equivariant method uh, that has been used earlier on images. Um, and similarly, when um, um, the grid is actually a regular lattice on a locally flat manifold. So it has been done in the, in the icosahedral CNN. Um, then our method exactly coincides with the gauge equivariant CNN. So that's interesting that even though we don't make any global assumptions on the structure of the space, when the uh, grid locally looks like um, such a, a structured space, um, we uh, get an algorithm that exactly coincides with, with things that have been done earlier on regular grids. And uh, I, I believe that this is, um, so, uh, so this, I believe that this is the first um, um, neural network that operates on graphs um, that um, when you apply them to these regular graphs, they get all these nice properties uh, that um, of, um, equivariant CNNs that have been used on images. Um, and I believe this is the first work to do so. Um, uh, some graphs are very nice and regular, but some graphs are quite messy. Uh, so, so the social graphs, which are heterogeneous, have a very large, um, heterogeneous, and thus they have a very large number of different edges and does a large number of different independent parameters. Uh, and this can quickly become impractical, um, both from a um, implementation perspective, you need to fit all of those in memory, and also because you get very little weight sharing, so not so much learning efficiency, um, when you have a large number of different edges in your, in your graph. So a solution uh, uh, we uh, uh, considered is to treat the message uh, as the output of a neural network that takes as input the local um, neighborhood graph, so the, the uh, for example, the adjacency matrix of the edge neighborhood and the input feature. Um, and then when one uses an equivariant graph network uh, for these, uh, for as message network, um, then um, we um, get a, local natural graph network without explicitly solving all these automorphism constraints. And we use a very uh, conventional uh, graph CNN as message network, but we could also use uh, a more expressive um, uh, uh, equivariant graph network. And so note here that we then use on each edge an equivariant graph network. 
Uh, we run some experiments um, and uh, we ran this on a standard uh, data set, uh, standard uh, class of um, uh, graph classification experiments. And we found uh, uh, results that are competitive with other equivariant graph networks. Uh, but our method is local and thus scalable, whereas these other equivariant graph networks um, rely on global operations, making them less scalable to larger graphs. So in conclusion, we used natural transformation, a uh, concept from basic category theory, to generalize equivariance uh, to, um, to new cases, which we need for our graphs. Um, and as a consequence, we built natural graph networks that can treat non-isomorphic non graphs uh, differently, whereas prior work, equivariant graph networks, um, treat all graphs uh, uh, the same. Um, and this also makes our uh, natural graph networks more expressive than uh, equivariant graph networks. Um, and then we introduced local natural graph networks as a variation uh, to make the solution scalable to larger graphs. Uh, but for heterogeneous graphs, we still found that in practice you find too many isomorphism classes. So we used message networks uh, to make the natural graph network practical. Um, there are some um, obvious um, future questions that I would be interested in exploring further. Um, basically, um, can we find such as um, in the relationship to the expressivity of these Weisfeder Lehmann expressivity tests, uh, a formal classification of the expressivity of this network, as has been done for equivariant graph networks, um, is a question I find very interesting. We find um, in some empirical evaluations um, that they are as expressive as equivariant graph networks in, uh, in uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, settings, but a proper formal analysis would be very interesting. And as a more broad future direction, I think that there sh must be a lot of um, low-hanging fruits of applications of such simple ideas from category theory to other areas within machine learning. Um, and uh, this is a direction that I'm uh, very interested in exploring further. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to any questions that may have arisen. Thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you and I hope you can hear it. Some knocking can, on the table because yes. we, we are not in the lecture hall right now. So I hope this is all right. There's uh, a couple of questions. So um, just uh, as a side remark, so, so how costly is the, you said the, the larger the subgraphs are, the more costly it is to detect. So what, what's the, the complexity of the subgraph detection in a heterogeneous graph? Um, so I think uh, worst case is, um, uh, uh, so worst case is I think super exponential in the size of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So um, fully connected and the neighborhoods quickly become the full graph and then it's excessively expensive. Um, yes. in, another, in another limiting case, for example, if you have a grid graph, um, then the size of the neighborhoods doesn't scale uh, with the size of the graph. Um, and um, then it remains practical. Um, so this is a, um, um, a trade-off. Um, and yeah, we found in practice that um, um, we, we found it to work well on the, on the data sets we tested it on. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, it depends on the graph. So in particular, if you think about it as a social network, then people who are connected to many people, they make things costly then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a, yeah. as a patchwork solution, one can always uh, kind of reduce large neighborhoods to kind of the, just themselves or size one. Um, mm -hmm. so you can, um, it, it, your neighborhood selection is very flexible. So you could come up with such ways of, of alleviating, uh, particular people who have like a million friends. Um, but, but it, yeah, arguably not the most elegant uh, strategy. Still, it's, it's a very interesting approach because the, the whole, um, 
system can be decomposed essentially with this approach and you essentially get categories of uh, neighborhood groups which is falls out of the algorithm which makes it very beautiful and you generalize to to regular grids that you can get essentially um, very well known methods which is a very cool relationship so also interesting if, if you think of a, a, a lattice or, um, and you have some holes in there then each hole essentially automatically generates um, a, a whole subnetwork of multiple observations that then share automorphism right so that's 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 yeah. a pretty nice property so yeah, depending yeah. on the whole size, you automatically get uh, uh, a subgroup of, of these networks that would all be comparable. So if these um, pop up more often, uh, so if I think of like defect pixel interpolation or stuff like, like that, then this, this could be very easily constructed and would automatically adapt for the non-observing, not observed parts, yeah, interesting. which is cool. Yeah. Yeah, something similar uh, pops up if you look at the edge of an image. Uh, because if you don't do any padding here, for example, you also get like separate uh, parameters on the edge, which can be something desirable or undesirable, depends on your use case. But indeed, you get yeah, that. I mean, uh, the boundary conditions uh, fall out of the approach immediately because yeah. you, you then start modeling uh, the boundaries in one category. And uh, this is simply shared which is also a pretty yeah. cool property. So also, um, if I think about the, the social networks, you just said that you can shrink it down to one nodes, but couldn't you also form like um, uh, similar categories, but not, not automorphism, but if you have one node that is connected to 100 or to 200 uh, other nodes, then you could use one of the other approaches for, for equivariance that you introduced and just um deal them in as as part of the same class of um uh, uh of special observations such that you don't have to model all of the edges uh individually i think that that is also a very nice approach so it's it it reminds me a bit of um a category in a language model that that would be a similar approach that you you know have a list of, of similar function words, right? They the verbs can be replaced and so on. And this is maybe, you know, celebrity or super spreader or whatever that has many, many connections. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. That, that's uh, a very interesting approach. There is uh, there are also other questions in the chat. So uh, one here is. Uh, can you some can you list some potential applications of your theory, and uh, what what are the practical applications that are being done with this? So I, I figure networks, and if you're working for Qualcomm, uh, there should be plenty of opportunity in the, in communication analysis, right? Um, so um, uh, we are exploring. Um, using this for um, kind of optimization things. So a lot of um, allocation and optimization problems you can reformulate as graphs or graph analysis is part of the approach. Um, and so um, uh, that is something that within Qualcomm uh, we're looking into. Um, um, and um, uh, yeah, in the paper, we also, um, and for our experiments, we also looked at kind of classical graph problems like molecules and um, graph classification and also shape analysis. Um, hmm. So, um, yeah, um, it's kind of a general graph approach, and I, although it's more suited to more suited to some graphs than other graphs. Yeah, but also image processing comes immediately up because you, you have all these uh, kind of filters and then you have grids, but then there's often uh, perturbations like, for example, defect pixels that I could see that would be an interesting approach. Yeah, that's and, yeah, it's very interesting. And probably also the, the whole simulation community, the finite element models and so on, where you also have topologies that are recurring and... Um, but these these are even more regular, right? They're, you have almost in all cases a, a regular 
um, kind of meshing? Uh, Still. Yeah. Um, but you also have finite element methods like in fluid dynamics that are like adaptively yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. choosing yeah. their um, gridding, I believe, but I'm, I'm not an expert in those fields. Um, but yeah, these, um, these could definitely be applied to these cases. Yeah. Very interesting cases. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for visiting us and uh, delivering this keynote here. I enjoyed your presentation a lot. And I think this also, so we, we just started looking into mainly into applications of graph models, but I think this is a very promising alternative to many of the things we're currently looking at. So yeah, thank you very much for, for coming here. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting. Yeah, you can see there were quite a few questions about PIMS presentation. I really enjoyed it a lot. If you have now any questions about what PIM presented here, you can send the questions to me. You can also leave them in the comments. I will connect to PIM and then forward them such that he can answer them. So the discussion is not yet over and you still have a chance to interact with him. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. And there are still a couple of videos coming up in this semester's Pattern Recognition Symposium. So I hope we will see you again in one of the next videos. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.